Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hi everyone, uh, it's, my pl it's my pleasure to welcome Elena Marashevich uh, from Columbia University uh, who's uh, worked on fair packing problems and fast distributed algorithms. Uh, so, over to Elena. Okay. Uh, she's here till Friday, so in case you haven't met her yet, uh, send me an email. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so, I, I'm a PhD student at Columbia University. This is a joint work with Cliff Stein and Gil Zussman. The work is on AlphaFair resource allocation, and I, I will explain very soon what it is. But let's start first with some applications. When it comes to fair resource allocation, the most well-known problems are those coming from network congestion control or network rate control. And Indeed, this is where fairness problems have been really mostly studied. But there are many other applications where we could care about fairness. Uh, more recently, there are problems in resource management and resource allocation in data centers. Uh, you can pose almost any operations research problem as a also fair resource allocation problem. I'm showing here healthcare scheduling, but there are also other instances of problems like uh, air traffic control or uh, allocation of cadaveric organs, etc. Uh, one instance where fairness problems arise that is not, uh, it, it is not really immediately clear that there exists a connection are market equilibria problems. And I will actually make this relationship more clear as we get towards the end of the talk. So let me start with the one example of def where we ca care about fairness to a different extent. So this is a very classical example that is very often used in uh, classes on communication networks. So the setting is we have one very long path that uses n minus one capacitated links, and we have n minus one short paths show shown here in orange that use only one capacitated link. And each link has a unit capacity. The question we want to ask is how do we allocate flows in this network? How do we allocate rates to, to these routes? Now, one thing is that if we are doing anything reasonable, we would give the same rate to each of the short routes because they just see the same constraints. They see the same condi conditions. Now, one objective we may want to have is just to maximize efficiency. In this case, efficiency means maximize the sum throughput. So take the most out of the network. If we were to do that, then we would give zero units of flow to the long route and one unit of flow to each of the short routes. This gives us n minus 1 efficiency, but it is very unfair, especially if the long route user was actually paying something to, to get something sent through this network. On the other end, if we really wanted to be as fair as possible, one thing that is not too difficult to see is that in that case, we would just give everyone half a unit of flow. But what happens in this case to our efficiency is that we have lowered it down by a factor of about two. So when you say maximum fairness, so what is efficiency? I, I'm, I'm intentionally a little bit vague right now. Okay. But uh, you can see here that you are actually uh, using all the links here to the maximum extent, and you are giving everyone equal amount of flow. The third type of objective we can think of is, OK, you know, like if we are very fair, our efficiency goes down. If we are very unfair, our efficiency is better. So maybe we should want, uh, want to look at some trade-off. And intuitively, the long route is using too many links. It uses too many resources. So maybe they should get something proportional to what they use. So in that case, we, we could assign 
1 over n units of flow to the long route, n minus 1 over n units of flow to the short routes, and our efficiency would actually be at least asymptotically close to the maximum efficiency. Now, if we were to somehow parameterize fairness on a scale from zero to infinity, then talking about the previous uh, problems that I've shown you, the first problem should really get zero because it, it had no fairness guarantees. The second allocation should be somewhere in the infinity because it was as fair as possible, and the third one should be somewhere in the middle. Right? This is just like intuitively speaking. The questions of measuring fairness or measuring inequality are, are actually not very new. Back in the 1970s, uh, there were questions asked about uh, measuring inequality, but in terms of inequalities of uh, income distributions. So the problem there was to rank different income distributions. And uh, the parameter alpha was called inequality aversion parameter. Uh, the functions that appear in this type of work are a, a little bit curious, and I'll tell you why on, on the next slide. So 30 years fast forward in the domain of uh, network congestion control, uh, there is a definition of alpha fairness. What is nice about this definition is, is the lemma that says that there exists a family of uh, concave objectives that we can maximize and actually reach this uh, alpha fair resource allocation. Now, these functions are the same functions as I've shown you on the last slide. They may not be very easy to remember, so the way to think about them is as functions whose derivative is 1 over x to the alpha. So a very high level intuition is that as x goes to 0, the uh, derivative goes to infinity, so you really want to push uh, all the allocations away from 0. And as alpha gets larger, you really push the allocations away from 0 to a larger extent. Now, for the three examples that I mentioned at the beginning, the first example uh, is actually the case of alpha equals zero. It is called utilitarian. In this case, we only have linear objectives. The second case is uh, known as maximum fair allocation, which is the most egalitarian way of allocating resources. And the third example is uh, known as proportional fairness, and it happens when alpha equals one. Now, the intuition about trading off efficiency and fairness is not only an intuition. Uh, there has actually been work in the last couple of years that uh, quantifies uh, this trade-off under different metrics. The problem that this talk is about is alpha fair packing. It is a class of problems where the feasible region is a polytope determined by positive linear constraints. Now, the problems with such feasible region have been really extensively studied for linear objectives, but not as much, at least not with the convergence guarantees for this more general objectives. These objective functions are concave, so in centralized manner, we know how to solve this in polynomial time. The focus of this talk is uh, to look into distributed algorithms that have asynchronous updates. So this is something that arises very often in, in practice, and even if we didn't have a really distributed setting, we could parallelize computation and get really fast algorithms. Sorry. Yes? So when alpha is zero, actually, there, this would imply you're maximizing the sum of the laws, not the sum which would what you seem to suggest from the last slide. No? What alpha equals zero? Oh, sorry, F alpha equals one. I mean alpha equals one. When alpha equals one, there yes, you're maximizing the sum of the logs. Okay, okay. So alpha equals zero. Alpha equals zero is, alpha equals zero alpha zero is, is the, the linear yeah. objective. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So the main result that I will talk about is an epsilon approximation algorithm that 
it is very robust. It has many nice properties. So it, it can run in distributed fashion. It allows uh, asynchronous updates. It only reacts to the current state of the network. It makes local updates. It can start from any initial state, which also means that it is fault tolerant. And it can, it can allow for a constant number of variables and constraints, insertions, or deletions. The convergence time of the algorithm is polylogarithmic in the input size and polynomial in the accuracy parameter epsilon. I, I will tell you more precisely what the actual convergence time is later after I introduce some notation. Uh, what I should point out here is that this is probably asymptotically the, the dependence you should de uh, expect for this type of algorithms. Because at least for linear programming, in, in this setting, there are lower bounds. Looking at the related work, when it comes to maximum fairness, uh, there has been really a, a lot of work. What, one thing to note here is that when we have max mean fairness, these problems are not anymore really convex optimization problem. What we get is a multi-objective problem where, where we are looking at the whole vector. And these problems typically have more combinatorial structure. At, at the other end of, of our alpha line, uh, there is work on packing linear programs. Most relevant to uh, this talk is the work by Averbuch and Kandekar. Uh, but of course, if, if we have linear programming, we can only support linear objectives. There is no straightforward extension of these results to the alpha fair setting. In terms of work on network congestion co control, there has been a lot of work in the last almost 20 years. Um, most relevant to this talk is work by Kelly. Um, what is interesting about this line of work, there is no guaranteed convergence time as a function of input. So the convergence time that is shown for these algorithms, they're usually continuous time algorithms, is that you reach the solution, you reach the optimal solution after some finite time. But there is no guarantee that this happens in polynomial time as a function of input. More recently, there has been work on network utility maximization. Uh, this work can solve all the, the problem I talked about after some scaling, but in general leads to a convergence time that is at least linear in the input, if not even polynomial. Uh, talking to Nikhil, well, we have actually observed that uh, one of the cases, uh, actually alpha equals one, is uh, equivalent to the problem of market equilibrium in Eisenberg Gale markets with Leontiev utilities. And there has been a work from stock 2013. Uh, what we have observed there is that the dependence on epsilon of this type of algorithm is better than in this work, but the dependence on input is worse. So it is at least linear, whereas here it is polylogarithmic. So I will move now to uh, talking about model and, and some of the preliminaries. So first of all, this just makes the analysis easier. It's a very standard thing to do in linear programming just to scale all the constraints. How do you scale them? So first, you divide both sides of each constraint by the right-hand side to get one on, on the right-hand side you divide all the constraint matrix elements by the minimum element, by the minimum non-zero element, and you scale all the variables by, by the same amount. What you get when you do that is that actually in the scale problem, uh, any non-zero entry of the matrix is at least one. What this gives you is that for any feasible solution, your variables must be between zero and one. Does everyone see this? Right, okay. Uh, why can we do this? We actually show that this preserves the approximation guarantees. So if you want to scale back, you, you will have the same approximation guarantees. And 
the scaling is really just for the purpose of the analysis. Uh, the algorithm can be run on the original instance. When you say approximation, uh, you mean uh, the objective as well as the constraints. Both are valid? Like, or so the, what I will show later is that uh, when algorithm runs, the constraints never get violated unless they were initially violated. But after polylog number of rounds, they are always satisfied. What I mean is that uh, the guarantee on the objective function is the same. So if multiplicative, you get the same multiplicative. If additive, you get the same additive. Okay. The model of distributed computation, uh, I will talk here in terms of sellers and buyers just for people who have worked on some market problems to, to be easier to um, just capture the main idea. So for every variable, we say that there is a node associated with that variable, and we can call it a buyer. For each constraint, there is also a node, and we can call it a seller. Now, between a variable and a constraint, there is an edge if a variable participates in that constraint, if it has a non-zero coefficient. So we add edges for such pairs and uh, add a coefficient over an edge equal to the coefficient with which this variable appears in the corresponding constraint. The type of information that nodes have is every buyer, every, what we need on the variable side. We need upper bounds on the global information. The information that is collected in each round is the, the price of the constraint variables. So that it would actually be enough just to uh, collect the relative congestion. So the variables collect information only for, from those constraints in which they participate. They don't need global information. For the constraint, our seller sets a price that is a function of the global problem parameters and of the relative slack or relative congestion. I'm calling it relative. In the non-scale problem, it would be relative. Here, it is just uh, an absolute slack. I is this model clear? So if we were in network congestion control problems, what this would mean is that we would need to, in each round, each node would need to collect the relative congestion on each of the links it uses on, on their path. Important for the analysis are actually KKT conditions. So just to get clear what, what the notation is, uh, with each constraint, we will associate a Lagrange multiplier that I, I will just refer to as dual variable. So if you write the KKT conditions, they're just a standard thing. You have primal feasibility, dual feasibility, complementary slackness, and the fourth condition you uh, get when you maximize the Lagrangian. This fourth KKT condition will actually be the most important one for the algorithm. So let me tell you what the algorithm is. But before I get there, I want to give you some intuition. So I'm writing at the top the KKT condition that I said would be the most important one. So there are two algorithms that seemingly won't look so similar. On the left is the algorithm by Kelly et al. from 1998. It is for a particular instance of alpha fairness. It is for alpha equals 1, known as proportional fairness. The algorithm is a continuous time algorithm. How it works, you describe all the updates in the network by a system of differential equations. One thing to notice here is that the updates of the primals, of the variables, are actually guided by any slack in this KKT condition. The dual variables are chosen as some unspecified monotonically increasing function of the, uh, so for, for a dual variable i, it is the left-hand side of the constraint i. 
in linear programming, we need some proper initialization. We start with some feasible solution. And uh, this algorithm actually has discrete updates. What happens in each round is that the dual variable is set as exponential function of this relative slack of the corresponding constraint. And then what algorithm does, whenever the KKT condition on the top is not satisfied, it makes multiplicative updates to get closer to making it satisfied. Uh, this is not completely multiplicative because there is a step increase delta if xj's are very small. Because if they are zero, we wouldn't be making any progress. For when there is a decrease, that there is a multiplicative decrease. So how the convergence of these two algorithms was shown, and for, for the first one, that there is no really dependence on, on the input size. It's just a finite time convergence. A certain potential function was used called the Lyapunov function. It's just a bounded, monotonically increasing function. If you look at the potential function for the linear programming, the, the first term looks similar. The second term, not so much. Now, in linear programming, it is quite standard to choose dual variables as exponential function of this constraint slack. If you use a similar idea for alpha equals 1 here, if you choose an exponential function here, and you plug this into the uh, potential function, you get a function of the same form. So this was one of the first observations th that we made when we started working on this problem. And this somehow gave us the intuition that we can get good convergence with discrete updates, with something that looks similar to the linear programming algorithm. Now, the algorithm is indeed very similar to the linear programming algorithm. We don't need a real initialization. We only need to restrict each variable to, to some domain between delta j and 1. So if a variable, for any reason, goes outside of this domain, we just put it back. Uh, the choice of the dual is only slightly different. We have some c in front of the exponent. One difference that does not seem so important, really, is that when we make a decrease, it is not always, uh, it is not always multiplicative. Because we are setting this lower threshold, we may be making a, a decrease that is smaller th than multiplicative. Whereas in linear programming, it is always as, at least as large as multiplicative. So, so this actually raises one challenge in, in, in the analysis. One thing just to notice here, for linear programming, the variables are always between 0 and 1 in the algorithm. Here, they will be between some delta j and 1. So the, it seems to me the difference between mm -hmm. putting the max here versus there is whether to bump it up to delta in the current step or the next step. Yes. So there, they allow it to go down a little bit, but in the next step, it will be back. Yeah. Um, yeah, but you would. There, there, is, there is a reason why you cannot really do a step increase here. Because your KKT condition looks different, what you can show here by the step increase is that the, the value of the left-hand side uh, does not change significantly. It changes by some small multiplicative factor. However, the, regardless of how the uh, variables update. In this case, you would lose you would lose that. But if uh, you were is that correct? Is the observation correct? Uh, the difference between the two algorithms? Is it what I said? Yes, the, you, you will make a step increase. But, but your uh, xj's here are allowed to become as small as possible. It doesn't mean that they, if they go below delta, they will go back. Isn't it because in the next step, wouldn't they go back? Not so necessarily. They can, they can, they can keep going down. down. They can keep going down. Actually, the problem is that maybe I'm just going back. Then go back 20, 30 years or whatever. Like this is a standard multiplicative algorithm that at least for LPs, right? 
Yes. So I, I don't understand. So I just want to get, I don't know this paper, our book in Khandekar. So they gave a better analysis for it or? Oh yeah, why is 2008? Like I, so, uh, is that, why do you, like because? Uh, uh, they, they get a very robust algorithm. So they get all these properties of uh, self stability They don't really get self-stabilization, but they get statelessness, statelessness. they get, um, solution is always feasible as long as the algorithm runs. So the cognitive they upgrade will give you something about the average. <coughs> you can get about everything you want. But no, usually no, you might violate. It doesn't give yeah, you something about the last one. Well, like right? common man, then yeah. Okay, the, like, yeah, but still, like I'm saying, that's the basic one. But people have looked at this one for the last 30 years. And there are other variants, right? They violate into it. Yes. Yeah, I think so. So, so I want, okay, maybe, yeah. maybe you will tell me later on why you said, I guess, but this as just. That is, I think, one of the things that maybe was resolved only here. Um, you know, I think even. I don't think like, even that is resolved already. Maybe, yeah. That that maybe the constraints are changing and so on. That's what they're doing. No. Um, it, gave, it gave somehow the, the right intuition, what was going on in, in terms of the potential function. I don't No, but this remember. is just a duality gap, right? No, but this uh, is it is not. No? But in, in this case, you have the scaling here linear, for the linear yeah. programming, and for it's more general alpha, it is not really a duality gap. But the, the potential in the case of LPs comes from the softmax and mean, right, essentially? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which so is the Can you rewrite? Yes, yeah, can basically. So yeah, everything here is. Can we be written in the terms of the derivatives of the softmax and the soft mean, in some sense? I mean, the, the exponential potential, in some sense. Maybe. Okay, but well, we can talk about this later. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay. Okay. But no, I just, I was wondering, maybe I was saying that it's not clear to me, at least this algorithm as such. No, but like, you can uh, turn the objective into a constraint uh, and then you yeah, just have visibility. It was just. It was just an intuition. Okay. So the algorithm, yeah, just uh, once again, the, the way to think about it is we're trying to satisfy this KKT condition. We choose duals as the exponential functions of the constraints. We look at the value of the left-hand side of the KKT condition. If it is somewhere around the, uh, the right-hand side, this gamma is just a function, it's a fraction of epsilon. So if it is close enough, we don't do anything. If it is far enough, if it is like much smaller, then we increase the xj to get closer. We increase it multiplicatively. If it is larger, we decrease <coughs> xj multiplicatively unless it goes below this threshold that we have set. Now, I, I will quickly tell you what the algorithm parameters are. They're a little bit complicated, so I don't think like anyone should think about them for the rest of the talk too much, but just if you want to get a sense of what they look like. So some notation, this is really what you would expect from the notation. So W max is the maximum weight, W min is the minimum weight, and A max is the maximum element of the matrix. So the parameters are, delta J's are this really complicated thing. Uh, there is a motivation for the choice of delta J on the next slide. We actually prove some lower bound that uh, each uh, component of this allocation vector takes. But we end up choosing something that is much looser, or at least about order and looser, for technical reasons later. I just want to again, I, for Lie program, alpha was one, right? It was zero. Sorry, it was zero. <laughs> <laughs> it, was okay. zero. it was zero. So you case, didn't so even have this x to yeah, the okay, alpha. Good. That is just dual, dual piece So in that case, what are you setting your delta j to be? Uh, is it polynomial? What is it? Uh, so you it? cannot go all the way down to linear programming with this. You need to be a little bit bounded away from zero, because uh, the lower bound goes to zero. Yeah, but like, are you polynomial bounded in the parameters of your input or the exponentially? Like. Uh, so, you are polynomially bounded, but there is a dependence on one over alpha. So alpha cannot go all the way down to zero. Right. That, that's, that's one catch. Okay. So the C that multiplies the exponent is conveniently chosen. If you look at delta J, the only difference in terms of J is just this WJ. When you raise the whole thing to the alpha and you divide it by delta J, you get the, the same thing. Cap is just 1 over epsilon times the log of the input. Gamma is epsilon over 4. 
and beta that determine these multiplicative updates that are one plus beta, one minus beta, <coughs> are conveniently chosen so that the left-hand side of the KKT condition does not change too much. It changes by a factor of one plus minus gamma over four. So we actually prove that if uh, some X star optimally solves alpha fair packing, then each element of X is bounded from below as a function of the input. Now, of course, you don't need to grasp like all the letters here in this equation. Uh, if you try plotting this as a function of alpha, it is actually a continuous function. Uh, I, I don't know if the bound is tight, but the bound changes quite dramatically between zero and one. When alpha is greater than one, there is much less change. And as alpha goes to infinity, you get something that is roughly one over n a max square. And i is the number of uh, non-zero elements in i-th constraint. I'm just talking about the order of magnitude here. OK. So let me move to the more fun part. <laughs> Just convergence analysis. So I'll give you a very high level overview of what happens. So the first thing we show is that if we started from an infeasible solution, we get to a feasible solution fast. If we were at a feasible solution already, the algorithm will not make the solution infeasible in any round. The second condition we get for free just by the choice of duals. The third condition for complementary slackness, we show it holds in approximate and aggregate sense after some polylog number of rounds, and, and that is actually sufficient. So these first three KKT conditions are in some sense preliminaries. Uh, the most work happens about showing some things uh, about this fourth one. The way the proof of convergence works, we choose a bounded non-decreasing potential function, and you won't be surprised what it is. And then we define some stationary intervals and show that if we are in a non-stationary interval, then the potential increases significantly. If we are, the solution is epsilon approximate. Okay. So the first lemma says, if we started with a feasible solution, we remain feasible. And I want to go just quickly over proof because it is relatively simple. It appears in the similar form in our book and Kandekar, this one and like the something that will appear in two slides from now. Uh, what I want to point out, if I gave you the parameters, you could go line by line and get the same proof. But one of the challenges is really finding these parameters and making them work. So the proof works as follows. You select the first round in which the solution becomes infeasible. Now, uh, some notation we just uh, denote by x0, x right before the update that made it infeasible, and x1 just right after the update. <coughs> now, the only way the solution could have become infeasible by the way the, al the algorithm worked, the only constraints that we could violate are, are the packing constraints. So this became greater than one. For this to happen, at least one variable that appears in the constraint has had to increase. Right? How would have otherwise gotten larger than one? For the variable to increase, we just by the way the algorithm works, we had to have this for the fourth KKT condition. Now from one round to another, the way that multiplicative updates are chosen this term can increase by a factor of at most one plus gamma over four. Combined with the previous line, this gives you something that is actually even strictly less than omega j. On the other hand, if you want to bound this from below, you just select one term and then you choose the term in, in which you have the dual that corresponds to the constraint that got violated. 
since we did the scaling, AIJ, since it's non zero, it is greater than or equal to one, so we can take it out. We have that XJs must be greater than or equal to delta J. Again, by the way, the algorithm works. And, and we just write out what uh, YIs are. The way we chose the, this is where I need the delta J not to be zero. Okay? So this thing is at least uh, WJ. The constraint got violated, so this is greater than zero. So the whole thing is greater than WJ, and, and we got the contradiction. That's not a, wait, the delta J, that's why it's not a problem in, in your programming, because alpha is zero. So yeah, works. because it doesn't show up there. Yes. Okay, so the next lemma shows if we started with an infeasible solution, we reach a feasible solution relatively fast. How, I won't get into all the details of the proof, but just how it works is, uh, after at most one round, we, you know, if this, if X was what violated the feasibility, it becomes positive after at most one round. So the only thing that could get violated, it remain violated are the packing constraints. Now the things we show here is that none of the variables that appear in this constraint decrease. So they cannot bring this down. The, all the variables that appear, at, oh, this should be actually increase. None of the variables that appear in I incre increase. All the variables that appear and are greater than one over N A max decrease. Since they decrease, they're large enough to decrease multiplicatively after just log based one minus beta ln A max, they, they will, one over N A max, that they will get down below one. So, Combined with previous lemma, we, we get that after some point, the solution is always feasible. Uh, what, another thing to point out is that you don't really have this in linear programming, and it, it is not too difficult to show it. That there you need to start from a feasible solution to remain feasible. For the complementary slackness, our third KKT condition, uh, we show that, again, after some polylog number of rounds, we get that it holds in, in approximate and aggregate sense. So the actual, all the KKT conditions are for, written for each YI. So just notice that this is written over the sum of YIs. And, and it is approximate. So what is left to deal with is just that famous fourth KKT condition. So let me tell you what the potential function is. Uh, this is just a reminder of what the KKT condition I was mentioning was, what the algorithm was, and what F alphas are. So the potential function is, is just a more general version of what we had for, for the algorithms that gave us the intuition. Now, the intuition about why this potential function makes sense is that if you look at partial derivatives with respect to xj's, and you just group this conveniently. What you get here is just the slack of your fourth KKT condition. And that's what guides the updates. So if some XJ increases, it must be because this term is actually positive. So the potential function increases. If some XJ decreases, it must be because this term is actually negative and the potential function increases once again. So the idea is whatever you do, whatever updates you make throughout the algorithm execution, potential function always, never decreases. It's the right way to say it. Okay. So the main idea for the rest of the proof is since we have that each xj is bounded in some interval, what you can show is that, you know, there are that there are bounds also for the potential function. They may be polynomially large, this gap may be polynomially large, even exponential in alpha, but it is bounded. So the algorithm makes updates as long as at least one KKT condition is not uh, approximately satisfied. Now, if you want to analyze this as long as algorithm make updates, 
it may take a very long time before our algorithm stops making updates. So the actual idea for the convergence is, well, the algorithm may have actually converged before it stopped making updates. So the type of the convergence that we get is that after at most, you know, polylog number of rounds, at least one round holds an epsilon approximate solution. And the total number of rounds where we don't have an epsilon approximate solution is bounded by, by the same term. So these are the actual number of rounds for even if you run forever. So after yes. at least many rounds it has to be. If you run for this long, then after this, oh I see. So again, okay, sorry. So you cannot make any claim about any one particular round. Yes. I mean you can also ask a question, why don't we stop after we reach this state? So if you were running algorithm in parallel, you could. But here you don't have a global coordination. So what, is, what do you mean by epsilon approximator? I'll see in the next slide. So for alpha less than one, it's one plus epsilon multiplicative in this many rounds. Uh, we just need to make epsilon small enough. That's okay. For alpha equals one, uh, W is sum of weights times epsilon. And this many rounds here, why is it one minus epsilon alpha? In this case, the objective is actually negative, always. Um, I, I intentionally didn't put alpha in the convergence time bound. Um, you will see in the next slide that you don't really want alpha to be very large, or at least you shouldn't expect for a very large alpha to have a very fast algorithm. So, okay. If you look at what these func functions look like for different values of alpha, th this is why there are three really proofs for these three cases of alpha. When alpha is zero, it is just a linear function. As alpha increases to one, the, this function, you know, becomes a little bit more curved. The, the gradient becomes larger and larger, like closer to zero. And as you get really close to one, it goes all the way up to the infinity. So it has the same shape as alpha equals one, but it is translated all the way up to the infinity. For alpha greater than one, again, you have the same shape of the function as at alpha equals one, but as you approach alpha from above, this function goes all the way down to minus infinity. What happens, and now the video will show alpha increasing from something close to one to 100 in, in steps of one. So what happens is that this function becomes really, really steep, really, really fast. So at alpha equals 100, it, it almost looks like a step function. So this is the reason why, at least using some of the conventional methods, you wouldn't really expect to have a very fast algorithm. Because at least for the first order methods, you need either that the um, gradient is bounded or that the gradient doesn't change too much. Or, or that the second derivative is bounded. Okay? I'll do a quick proof sketch for alpha equals one. I should have mentioned, so some of the preliminary results are on archive. Uh, they don't contain this part. This is in part one reason why I'm talking about this, but they will be posted relatively soon. So a uh, heads up, I will assume that uh, I start from a proper, uh, properly initialized solution. I don't really need this. It is possible to extend the proof to start from any uh, initial solution, but I, I just don't want to complicate things too much. So since potential never increases, the, what you start from is actually the minimum potential. So delta j is really small, so you have a huge slack in each of the dual variables. So you will get something that is of the order sum of the weights times log. The maximum potential happens where it is bounded from above by x when x is one, 
what you get in, in that case is just zero. So the total increase in the potential is sum of the weights times log. Now to get the convergence bound that we want, we need to show that in each stationary interval, the increase, we will actually here have stationary rounds, that the increase is this w possibly times some polynomial in epsilon and possibly over some polylog of the input. So this is what we are shooting for. One, one thing that we need to show is that uh, I won't go over the proof, but so I, I have mentioned at the beginning that, that, that there is a problem when we are not making multiplicative updates. In, in this, I, I will call the variables that, that are close to delta j, that if, if we were to make a decrease, wouldn't have, we wouldn't do it by a multiplicative one minus beta, I would call those variables small. The other variables I will call large. So what the next lemma says is that the increase in the potential due to decrease of small variables is dominated by the increase in the potential due to decrease of large variables. So whatever small variables do is dominated by, by what the large variables do. Is this clear? I, I'm stating it as one lemma, it's actually at least two, but just to give you the actual idea. For the increase in the potential, we show the, the, the following result. Uh, S plus just uh, is those xj's that increase and, and we have like the same notation for before and after an update. So we show this result. So let me just uh, tell you that if here, if we have a large gap in our KKT condition, if the gap is at least uh, one plus two gamma, we would have gamma times this increase. Well, we will see it soon. And then just let me remind you that the sum of weights is capital W. So we define a stationary round in this way. Why? One thing we show is that actually these stationary rounds are going to give a large potential increase. So if a round is non-stationary, in case you know this first part of the definition is violated, we need both to hold for the definition to, to be valid. Right? Uh, what happens then is that we, we just get that the potential is greater than or equal to W over tau. I'll remind you what tau is in a bit. If the second condition doesn't hold, then just com by combining these two things, we, we get that the increase is actually gamma times w. Now, I'll remind you that tau is just at the order of log squared over epsilon squared. So what we get in a non-stationary round is that we have indeed a large increase in the potential. And if you recall what our total increase in the potential was, combining these two things, you will actually get polylog in input over polynomial in epsilon. I, this is just the, the main idea. Is it clear? Another thing that, that I won't really show, but I tell you how, how we show that uh, the solution is actually epsilon approximate. We show that in each, uh, by looking at the duality gap, we show that in each uh, stationary round, uh, this is bounded by some constant times epsilon times capital W. So the right-hand side term is bounded by using approximate complementary slackness, which was one of the preliminary lemmas, and the second part of the stationary round definition. The left part is bounded by using part one of the stationary round definition, and actually a lower bound on this proof that, of this term that I won't get to go into, but that, that's, this is just what the main idea is. Now, in, in the rest of the time, I guess we have only a few more minutes, right? Five minutes. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to get to the relation between uh, this sort of problems and some of the markets. So 
I expect most of you know what Fisher markets are, but I'll nevertheless go over it. So in Fisher markets, we have buyers on one side and goods on the other. Uh, their buyers are indexed, say, by J and goods by I. The XIJ is the amount of good I allocated to a buyer J. And uh, every buyer has some money. Uh, it gets some utility of a bun bundle that gets allocated to them. Uh, and there are some prices of goods. So the market equilibrium of, of, of these problems is captured by Eisenberg Yale convex program that looks kind of similar to our alpha equals one case. Eisenberg Gale markets were in introduced in 2007 by Jane and Vazirani. They are just a generalization of uh, Fisher markets where a buyer may be interested only in a subset of goods and for some subset of goods may want goods in some specific ratios. So these are actually just the markets that solve Eisenberg Gale type convex program, which is just a more general convex program than, than the previous one. If you want to interpret alpha equals one case as a market, you could do it by choosing linear utilities. We have that each buyer wants only a specific subset of goods and in specific ratios. The, I, I will borrow an interpretation of Vazirani, which is uh, building a product. So here there, there is a number of goods and one buyer maybe wants to make a cake here. So the buyer needs the goods in specific ratios. Maybe one third should be flour, one fourth eggs, one fourth sugar, and then whatever is left, left cherries and the buyer doesn't really want uh, eggplant. So they want to make as many cakes as possible, but they, they need goods in specific ratios. And of course, there are other buyers who are interested in other subsets of goods. For me, the easiest way to look at the connections between these three problems is by looking at network flow problems. Because this is where actually the alpha equals one case came from originally. If you want to interpret these problems as network flow problems, the, the problem is as follows. For each variable, you have a source and sync pairs and a fixed number of paths and you fix flow over paths in specific ratios. So your allocation is the total, total flow between the source and sync paths, between the source and sync pair, pairs. Eisenberg Gale markets are a more general, general version of this where again you have a source and sync pairs but you want you can split flow over the paths anywhere any way you like and for linear utilities you, you would be fair in, in terms of the total flows but you can have some other utilities the fisher markets are a special case of eisenberg gale markets but but not of the problem above where once again you can split the flows over as many uh, over in any way you like over the paths but only one edge per path is actually capacitated whereas in these two cases there can be arbitrarily many edges that are capacitated so to summarize i have talked about a fast distributed and very robust algorithm for the class of alpha fair packing problems this problem arises in many applications uh, some open problems are whether these techniques could apply for ongoing Eisenberg Gale markets. And, and this could be important, for example, for the development of automated online markets. Another question is whether some of these techniques apply to or extend to other types of convex problems. So that would be it. Um, are there any more questions? I think I'm exactly on time, even though we started three minutes later. <laughs> yeah. Any questions? Okay. No? Okay. Thank you.
Okay, thank you.